Hello, I'm Paul Sparrow, the director of the Franklin Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum in Hyde Park, New York, and welcome to the 2021 Roosevelt Reading Festival. We're doing it virtually this year. Hopefully next year we'll be back on site uh, with live programming. Uh, but for, for now, we're doing it virtually, and I think you're going to really love our next author, uh, Jack Riggs. Uh, Jack has written a remarkable book about uh, one of the often unsung but most important aspects of, of the New Deal, which was rural electrification and the TVA and FDR's commitment uh, to try to bring power and to break the monopoly of the power utilities, the private power companies, uh, that was causing uh, many poor people to live in darkness and without things. His book, High Tension, uh, is a terrific book, the ba FDR's Battle to Power America. Uh, please welcome Jack Riggs. Jack? I thank you, Paul. I'm honored to be here. Uh, it's great to have you here. And again, as I said uh, when we were talking earlier, that I really do think this is one of those stories that people don't fully understand. Everybody just takes electricity for granted. Um, but I would like you know, to, to sort of lay the foundation here, which was that in the turn of the century, you know, electricity was not uh, ubiquitous. As a matter of fact, there weren't even just one kind of electricity. There were two kinds of electricity. Uh, and there were two sort of titans, uh, Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla. Talk a little bit about how electricity first started being used to distribute power and the battle between AC and DC. The, the War of Currents is what you're talking about, was uh, primarily in the 1880s. Uh, Thomas Edison uh, started the first, really the prototype of the modern utility when he set up the Pearl Street Station in downtown Manhattan. And he was using direct current, DC power. And uh, pretty soon, uh, George Westinghouse, taking advantage of an invention by Nikola Tesla, uh, started using uh, alternating current, AC power, which had the advantage of being, uh, you could transmit it further. Edison's original uh, power station could only transmit power for about a half a mile because you would lose so much power through the heat loss in the, in the wires. The battle went on and they both accused the other of being unsafe. Uh, it was mainly Westinghouse and Edison that were having the public relations battle, although Tesla was the, uh, the genius behind Edison's system. Um, eventually, AC won that battle because of the ability to take power a longer distance so you didn't have to have a generating station every half mile. It also meant you could bring power in from uh, rivers many miles away, the bigger dams, which were very important in the New Deal, were only possible because of AC, alternating current. Um, and that was that was an exciting period. And I, I only touch on it in a few pages in the book. There's a wonderful book uh, called Empires of Light by Jill Jones, which uh, you might, uh, your, your viewers might want to take a look at if they want to look at that period in detail. But following that period, uh, Edison, Westinghouse, and a third major company were competing and the bankers behind Edison's company forced him to merge with Thomson Houston, the third major company. And it was quite a bit bigger than Westinghouse. That new company became General Electric and Edison was essentially forced out of it. And he was really hurt that they didn't keep his name. But for the next couple of uh, decades, uh, the electricity system expanded very rapidly. At the beginning, it was only for residential use. But in the 1990s and particularly in the, I'm sorry, in the 1890s and particularly in the 1900s, the first decade of the century, industrial use expanded greatly and the use for trolleys, electric streetcars expanded greatly. So the industry was growing by leaps and bounds. And at that point, the face of the industry and the genius behind it was a guy named Samuel Insull, who had been an aide to Edison first just to answering his mail and being his bookkeeper, then eventually became his right-hand man, not as an inventor, but as a businessman. When he left the new General Electric and took over as head of the utility in Chicago, Chicago Edison, and basically over several years took over all the other utilities in Chicago, created a monopoly and revolutionized the utility industry by lowering prices so he could sell more power, so he could buy bigger generators, which were going to be more cost efficient than the smaller ones. And uh, 
from then until he got in trouble in the late 1920s, he was the face of the private utility industry. Uh, power continued to grow. We, I, I say something in the book about high tension wires were uh, marching across the country the way the railroads had crossed the country uh, 50 years before. And uh, everybody except farmers, not everybody, but uh, most people in the United States in urban areas had power by the 1920s. Uh, fewer than 10% of farmers did. And that was one of the things that Roosevelt take, took advantage of, both when he ran for governor and as governor. He spoke to those farmers without electricity. He tried to pretend he was one of them. He talked about his family farm in uh, upstate New York. Um, but the, the private utility industry was trying their best to snuff out the public power, which was usually municipal utilities at that point. The federal government wasn't in it. Um, and there could be vicious fights. Uh, the private power had to have a franchise from the city. And if they weren't giving the city good enough prices, the city may might have set up a municipal utility. And of course, that was called socialism. The private utilities attacked them at every opportunity. And in World War II, there were the first uh, glimmerings of what became the TVA to protect against the loss of nitrates, which we got from Chile. The United States felt they had to build a nitrate plant, which took a lot of power. And we needed nitrates both for weapons and for fertilizer. And we built that, um, they built a dam at Muscle Shoals on the Tennessee River in Northern Alabama. And when the war was over, the Harding administration came in the Wilson administration assumed it would have been run by the government. The Harding administration wanted to sell it to private power. And uh, that battle went on throughout the 20s, whether it would be private or public. The Alabama power wanted to buy it and transmit the power. They were the main utility in the area. Henry Ford wanted to buy it at one point. He offered a ridiculously low price. Uh, and the guy who blocked both of those was a senator from Nebraska named George Norris. He was a progressive Republican, but he came, became Roosevelt's biggest ally in the Senate on TVA and public power in general. Uh, there were bills on both sides that came up in the Congress. They didn't pass. They were at a stalemate throughout the 20s. And so when Roosevelt uh, came into power in 1932, the, the time was ripe for uh, something to happen with Muscle Shoals. He had a majority and he could move forward. And what he did was create the TVA. So high tension begins with Franklin Roosevelt's uh, speech uh, in Portland in September of 1932 when he was running for president. Um, and uh, he really decided to make uh, these private utility companies the, uh, the enemy, the boogeyman. Uh, and it's sometimes, you know, it, it sort of, the speech really outlines his agenda for electricity issues and the government's role in it. So what did he propose in that speech? Well, um, with, one, with one exception, he generally described the problems as he saw them. And you can see his uh, future agenda in an emb embryonic stage, but his only specific proposal was to build federal dams on major rivers in the, as he said, in the four corners of the United States on the Tennessee, the St. Lawrence, the Columbia and the Colorado. And that was the headline from the speech because that was the new news. But he also excoriated the huge private utility holding companies that had basically dominated the industry for the last 20 years. Uh, he blamed the private utilities for not taking power to rural America, where as I said, the, probably only about 10% of farmers had had power at the time. Uh, so he hinted at the Rural Electrification Administration, which was to come. He hinted at, or more than hinted at, the big federal dams he wanted to build. He alluded to the problem of the concentration in the uh, utility in industry, the holding companies, and that became perhaps his most contentious proposal once he was in power. But those, those four uh, major elements, rural electrification, TVA, the Columbia River dams, and breaking up the big holding companies were 
the guts of his agenda during the first couple of terms he was in office. And of course, building these giant dams, which were massive projects, uh, went directly to his you know, WPA and Works Project Administration and, and the idea of giving people jobs, uh, exactly. putting people to work, creating real assets for America. And it's one of the reasons that the they were, were so successful. Now, the, the TVA Act was the first one that was really passed. I think, was that in the first 100 days? I think it was. Yes. What, 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 were, what were its major challenges you know, in trying to get it implemented? Well, the implementation was tricky. Getting it passed was not hard because it was going to create jobs because the people in that region wanted it. So even the people who didn't like the government in the business, it, if he tried to go national with something like TVA, he probably couldn't have done it all in one, one piece of legislation. But because it was regional and more of a test, he was able to. I think he introduced the bill, Senator Norris introduced it in the Senate on April 10th, uh, just about a month after he was inaugurated. And Senator Norris, who was chair of the Agriculture Committee, passed it out of the committee two days later without hearings in a 12 minute session. It was just, it was easy. They, he, he had them primed, it was ready to go. There, there was a little more difficulty in the house because uh, the leader of the private utilities industry at that time, Samuel Insel was discredited um, partly because his, he got overextended and his big companies went under during the crash in 1929. But the new head of the industry was Wendell Wilkie and he had become president of Commonwealth and Southern Holding Company, one of the, not the largest, but one of the large holding companies just a, f a few weeks before. And he was the first witness in the House hearings on TVA because one of his utilities, Tennessee Power Company, was the one that was gonna be most hurt by TVA taking over that territory. And he was a very effective witness. He was, uh, charming. He was funny. He he had been a courtroom lawyer, very good he, on his feet. Today, we don't think of witnesses in congressional hearings as walking around as if they're speaking to a jury, but he did. And he was quite effective. And he zeroed in on one problem. He said that if, uh, if you take away our markets, you take away our business. And we need to be able to transmit the power that comes from Muscle Shoals and any future dams you build. Um, if, if the government transmits it, you're taking our markets and you will kill us. And he persuaded the House to compromise on the transmission issue, but Roosevelt managed to get the Senate conferees to hold firm in the conference committee. So the bill basically passed and was signed into law as Roosevelt had written it. Um, the problems with implementation were, uh, there were probably three main ones. First was how much territory TVA would get, which the other side of that coin was how much territory would the private utilities in the Tennessee Valley lose? Um, and then a, another key question was what rates would TVA charge? Because if they charge rates too low, then they would capture a lot of the business that was currently going to the uh, private utilities. The leader, the electricity leader in TVA, it was a multi-purpose agency. Uh, the chairman was uh, Arthur Morgan, but the guy that was in charge of the electricity programs was David, David Lilienthal. He had been a utility commissioner in Wisconsin, didn't trust the private utilities, and he believed what Samuel Insull had believed and had created, that you needed to keep the prices low so people would buy more power and that would allow you to develop more generation, in his case, build more dams. And so he wanted low rates to be able to take over more territory. Uh, Wilkie thought that the low rates were unfair. It was subsidized by the government and you were taking his territory, which meant that you couldn't, um, that, that he couldn't really fight back. There was also an internal battle in TVA between Chairman Morgan and Lilienthal. Morgan tended to side more with the private utilities, but for internal reasons, the three directors had divvied up the responsibilities and Lilienthal had principal responsibility for the electricity side. 
So he was the one that was fighting Wilkie on rates and on territory. And that went on for several years. Um, there was also a public relations fight between the two uh, cities that might want to go to a municipal utility so they could buy TVA power, would have a referendum. The private utilities would put in a lot of money and try and defeat the referendum. The TVA people would try and help the city get the uh, referendum passed. So there were battles going on in several ways. And then eventually they became uh, courtroom battles. Private industry litigated against TVA. At first they said the federal government has the authority to build dams for navigation, flood control, and if you generate power um, as, a, as a side benefit of that, that's okay. But there's nothing in the constitution that says you can transmit that power to sell it. So that was their first big lawsuit. And the court eventually said that um, that they did have the right to do that. Uh, but those the, the the fight over territory, the fight over right, rates, and the fight in the courts were uh, it went on for several years in the 1930s. Eventually, TVA won the court fights. Uh, Wilkie had to sell Tennessee Electric to TVA. Um, he and he and Lilienthal were both from Indiana, and uh, they had a ceremony where Lilienthal gave Wilkie a big check for his utility. And Wilkie, who was always good before the camera, said, "This is a lot of money for a couple of Indiana farm boys to be handing around." <laughs> so it it was uh, it was a loss, and he was he, he got a good price for his company, but but he did he did lose the company. Now we'll come back to Wilkie in a minute, but I, I've always felt that polio and FDR's experiences in Warm Springs, Georgia, were one of the foundations of which he built this passion he had for rural electrification and the TVA and all of these projects. He, when he went down to Warm Springs, Georgia in the mid-1920s, um, the area around the sort of rundown spa that he bought and turned into this polio rehabilitation center was desperately poor, uh, mm -hmm. particularly the, uh, the black sharecroppers and even many of the white farm workers they had not did they not only not have electricity they didn't have running water many of them lived in one room tar paper shacks with you know multiple children and sometimes multiple generations of adults and in a kind of poverty that roosevelt had really never experienced before and he understood that there is this enormous potential in the south if you could get electricity to these communities um so you know, why did it take him so long to move it into that top priority, you know, after the midterms in 34? Um, I think because it didn't have as many jobs associated with it as building the big dams and some of the, you know, Works Progress Administration, some of the things that he did in the first two years were the ones that created the most jobs. Uh, but he was committed to this. Uh, maybe it was theoretical or intellectual at first until he actually saw firsthand some of those farmers around Warm Springs. But even when he was running for governor in New York in 1928, and while he was governor, uh, he, he tried to bring public power to the state, partly to keep prices down, partly to bring power to rural areas. But um, he was pushed by a guy named Morris Cook, who's another fascinating character. He had worked in the early 20s for Governor Gifford Pinchot of Pennsylvania, who developed some, I think Cook did the, the legwork, but Pinchot was known for his uh, great power plan in Pennsylvania. He wanted to take electricity to rural areas. He also wanted to move factories out to rural areas to build the power plants near the coal mines so that all the jobs didn't go to people in the cities. And he never had a sympathetic, leg although he was a Republican, the Republican legislature was pro-private utility and never supported his great power plan. But the ideas went out around the country and were implemented in some other states. Morris Cook, who was the guy who drafted the plan, later worked for Roosevelt when he was governor in New York. And he pushed, he, he developed a proposal and sent it to the White House, didn't hear anything back. He finally went to see Harold Ickes, who was Roosevelt's uh, interior secretary, another progressive Republican, as Cook was. And Ickes was sympathetic. And uh, he said, write up a plan. Ickes gave him one, but it included cooperation with the private utilities. 
And Icky said, I don't want to have anything to do with those sons of bitches. And Cook then saw an opportunity. He said, well, if I develop a plan that's entirely government run, would you support it? He said, draft it. So Cook developed it, brought it in, got a great public relations team to uh, doctor up the report with a fancy cover. He had heard that Ickes liked red barns. So every barn that appeared in that report was red. It was just, it was a public relations masterpiece. And one was sent over to the White House. And Cook said later, he thought the reason it got red was because of the fancy cover. But um, Roosevelt liked it, said, go ahead. And it took Cook about a year to develop, negotiate. He tried again to see if the private industry would be supportive. They would not. He tried to see if municipal utilities could support it. They couldn't because most utilities could not provide electricity outside their city limits. So he basically fell back on a concept that was first developed in TVA, the idea of a rural electric co-op, a member-owned cooperative. And the REA provided most of its power to those co-ops. First, it helped, had to stand them up, get them started, and provide the power to them. And they also sold, um, TVA sold a lot of power to municipal utilities. Uh, rural electrification didn't. They were, they were doing it through these co-ops for the most part. And it grew slowly and then it took off. It was very popular wherever it happened. The, the, the poverty in farms without electricity, they were living the way their grandparents had lived. They, they had to haul an average for a, an average family might have to haul in 50 pounds worth of wood every day for fires, for heat and the stove and an occasional bath. Um, they had to pump their own water or carry it from a nearby stream if they had one. Uh, it was just a brutal lifestyle. And when they got electricity and first got electric lights, and then maybe the next thing would be a fan because that was cheap, would cool the house a little bit. But when they got a water pump and a stove, that that was, it just changed their life no end. And uh, every politician wanted to be part of these ceremonies when a co-op got started they would often have a little funeral and bury a kerosene lamp to say you know that's dead now we've got electricity it was um i i think perhaps made the most difference to the most people of any program in the new deal social security maybe over the long run but that took a long time before people started to get the benefits people got electricity very quickly and it changed their lives very quickly i think you can't understate it uh, there's a economic historian uh, uh, at Stanford, uh, Gavin Wright, who said something, you, the social implications for rural households can scarcely be overestimated. It, it, was, um, it was stunningly important. So FDR is reelected in a massive landslide in 1936, <clears throat> but he doesn't really do a lot of new initiatives after that. However, the wheels of government development, you know, uh, continued to turn and these dams were built and new power systems were set up. And Wendell Wilkie, who was a Democrat, uh, was selected by the Republican Party to run against FDR in 1940, uh, partly on this idea uh, that, you know, FDR was a socialist and we needed, you know, smart business oriented leadership. Yeah, but I think uh, there's a, another big program there that uh, developed in the second half of his first term. And that was the Public Utility Holding Company Act. He had said in his Portland speech and in the campaign that he was gonna try and rein in these big uh, utility holding companies. They were, uh, they were financial structures uh, designed to control a lot of utilities at the ground level. And they just got bigger and bigger. If you, uh, if you built a couple of layers, a smaller number of people could control all of those operating utilities with a smaller number of shares. And they got greedy and they started to manipulate the stock prices. Uh, they would siphon the dividends up from the utilities up to the top to these few owners at the top. Many of them were investment bankers, not utility people. And they also got a lot of uh, fees from all of the transactions when you created a new company and merged it with another company. And Roosevelt wanted to abolish those holding companies. He had a, he had a meeting with his staff in Warm Springs uh, 
right after the midterm elections in 1934. And they were sitting around with scotch and water after dinner talking about how to do it. He wanted to tax the holding companies to death by taxing the dividends each level they went up in that holding company pyramid. And most of his staff thought, no, you can regulate them and eliminate the excesses. And that that debate went on within the administration for several weeks. And finally, he conceded to most of his staffers who wanted to do the regulation. And they prepared a bill and uh, introduced it in uh, 1935. And it eventually, it one, one historian, uh, I'm trying to remember who it was. I think it was um, FDR biographer uh, Kenneth Davis said that the utility lobbying campaign against against this bill was the most intense since the Kansas-Nebraska Act before the Civil War. It was bitter and brutal. And the utility industry had a huge public relations arm. Back in the 20s, they were they had such a re good reputation because they had persuaded everybody that they brought them electricity and electricity was a good thing. And they were good public servants. One of their, and, and they, their trade association told the utilities, don't be afraid of advertising because your ratepayers are going to pay the bills because they could charge all of that to the ratepayers. So they had a good reputation. And one of them said, we used everything except skywriting. And when the, uh, administration came up with this holding company act, they turned this whole public relations effort against it. And Wilkie, who had already become prominent because of his opposition to TVA, became their spokesperson. And he was quite good. Um, the battle went on for several years. Again, the utility industry took it to, took it to court. Um, eventually, it, actually not until after World War Two, did they succeed in having it declared constitutional? But um, that was that was done uh, in the first term, and frankly, all of his all of his major initiatives were done or started in the first term. And after that landslide victory in 1936, uh, he didn't do anything else. He he made one big well several mistakes, but his huge mistake was the uh, court packing scheme where he he tried too hard to uh, get a majority in the court. And actually he, he cited TVA and the Holding Company Act as two of the reasons he had to change the court, but he wouldn't accept a compromise. He, he probably could have got one or two judges. He couldn't take yes for an answer. The court started giving him some positive decisions. He pursued it to the bitter end and lost some of his support among Democrats in Congress. So from the second term on, he had no real electricity initiatives. Wilkie was making a good name for himself. And then when the 1940 election came up, a lot of the internationalist Republicans who didn't like the fact that the, the front runners in the Republican Party, Vandenberg and Taft and Dewey, were all pretty much isolationists, they got behind Wilkie. And in the story that most of us, first time most of us heard about Wilkie was that convention where he... Um, came in as a dark horse candidate and, and won the nomination. And he won it because he had been an effective opponent of the New Deal. So there's this massive increase in electricity generation, new dams coming online, new transmission lines, uh, municipal utilities and public utilities. How did Roosevelt's electricity program affect the factories, uh, particularly as they started to shift production towards the war effort after 1941? Well, it was not just shifting production. We were building new industries, really. Um, they were, were hugely important, especially TVA and the Columbia River dams. At that point, it was just two, Bonneville and Grand Coulee. And TVA had been building some smaller dams on tributaries after their first two dams were completed. They made it possible for us to gear up for World War II. When we think about the arsenal of democracy, the aluminum industry to build all those planes and steel for the ships, a lot of that was done in the Northwest because of the power that came from the Columbia River. The Columbia River has the has 40% of the hydroelectric potential in the United States. And it ginned up very fast. TVA ginned up a little more slowly, but they had more plans ready to go. So they were able to uh, increase their uh, 
output dramatically during the second half of the war. Uh, I don't I don't know how we would have done it. The private industry said, we don't need any more power. We've got a 20% reserve capacity. That's enough. We needed way more than 20% extra. And TVA and uh, I think TVA and the two big Columbia River dams increased their production by close to 100% between 1941 and 1945. Uh, private industry probably couldn't have done that. Well, for one thing, private industry can't build a plant because they're not going to be sure they're going to get the um, their costs recovered in rates. So they want to make sure the demand is there before they build a power plant. Understandable. The government can plan and build plants in anticipation of demand. And that's what they did. Okay, we're going to take questions from the audience in just a minute, but I have two more questions for you. One is, you know, there seems to be a lot of parallels between these electric utilities of the 1920s and 30s and the high tech companies of today uh, with these massive, highly profitable, very politically astute uh, companies that have sort of learned to defy government regulation. Do you see parallels there? And, and, and how do you what lesson can we learn from the power battles to apply today? Well, I think there are some parallels and, and I, I think many of us are suspicious of bigness. No analogy is precise, and the the utility holding companies aren't exactly the same as the huge big tech companies today. It didn't start with the electric utilities. It, we had the Teddy Roosevelt, the trust buster, and people were, William Jennings Bryan was going after the railroads in the 19th century. Bigness has always been a concern to progressives, and I think that's the parallel. I don't think you can look at the legislative solution that was used against the utilities and use that against, you know, the Amazon or Apples or Googles or whoever the the people are afraid of now. The the it was a financial structure in the utilities industry that they had to break down. Um, no single one was that big. Okay, we have our first question uh, from CT. Uh, so, how might this help inform current policy in dealing with energy consumption demand today and the current climate crisis? Um, it was a different kind, of, it was a different time. And in retrospect, the big dams and the encouragement of more consumption in the New Deal would be anathema to us today. At that time, more consumption, more consumption of power was a good thing. We wanted the farmers to have appliances. We wanted the factories to um, put in more motors. Um, and you know, when we think about uh, the big dams on the Columbia River, some people were aware that they were killing some of those fish runs, but cheap power was more important. So I don't think we can look at these programs as a model for environmental programs today. I think what we have to do is learn from experience that sometimes conservation is better than more production. Uh, sometimes green power is better than coal fire. Most of the plants, the government dams were hydropower, which could damage rivers, but it wasn't as polluting in terms of air pollution, water pollution, as the coal fired plants, which were the rest of the power. Um, we've got lessons to learn from it, but I think we learned from their mistakes more than from what they did. But it, it seems to me that the lesson is that the federal government should be taking the lead on a sustainable renewable energy, solar and wind and other things that are uh, sustainable, that the industry keeps claiming it's not affordable to, to, to scale it up. Um, so it, it does seem like there is at least some parallel there. Oh, yeah. And a lot of that is happening at the state level, too, a, a, a renewable fuels mandate to require utilities to have a certain percentage of their power as renewables. Yes, that that is a good thing. I'm not sure. We learned that from the New Deal, but except maybe from what the New Deal didn't do. Yes, we can do more of that. All right, our last question. You worked for Congress for nearly 20 years. So how would you compare the legislative process in the 1930s and the interaction between the president and the Congress and the situation as it exists today? There are a lot of big differences. Um, actually, when you put it that way, I guess when I started working for Congress, 
it was closer to when Roosevelt took office than it is today. So I, I was somewhere between the two. Um, but one of the things that struck me as I read about those congressional hearings and the congressional battles, clearly they did not have the, um, the polarization we have now. You had a conservative liberal split, but it wasn't strictly along party lines. There were liberal Republicans and obviously many conservative Democrats, especially from the South. Um, and I think they got along better. I, I don't know that, because that was a long time ago. Um, they had much longer recesses. They didn't, uh, they didn't meet as long during the year. Uh, you didn't have the kind of um, public involvement you have now because of the internet and emails. It's much easier for people to write to Congress. Uh, they, they both were willing to use public relations. Uh, one episode that I described in the book was when Senator, Senator Hugo Black ran a Senate hearing on um, lobbying abuses by the utility industry. And it was clearly for show. The first day he said, I guess with public listening, but he said to his staff, tell the boys of the press to come in. The show is about to begin. And it was clearly designed to uh, influence public opinion, not to draft legislation. So some things, are still the same. Uh, I think people stayed longer. There, there are longer, longer serving members then than there are now. Um, the, the way hearings were held, it's interesting. There's some pictures. I, I probably found some of them on the, um, on the FDR library's uh, photo list. Uh, I saw some in the Library of Congress. You would see uh, witnesses standing up and walking around and talking to the uh, members of the committee. Sometimes you would see one witness with the few members, probably the subcommittee, all sitting around the same table. Now, of course, all the members of Congress have to look like judges with the dais that's higher than the witnesses and all that. So, so there have been changes. Uh, okay, well, we have our last question, and I can't deny her. This is from Kathy Delano, who is, in fact, a descendant of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, she asks, do we need a federal program to bring broadband to rural areas today? So this will be your, your last question. Uh, I don't know enough about broadband, broadband to know exactly how it has to happen, but a lot of people have asked me about whether the Rural Electrification Administration is a model. And to the extent that it made a priority of getting a service, an important service to people who didn't have it, and it did it primarily through providing credit. That may be a useful analogy. The farmers in the 30s needed credit to run the lines out to their house and to buy the appliances. I think the people without broadband access, access today, they need to get the, the service to their neighborhood, apartment building or farm, whatever. And they may need uh, credit to be able to buy the devices so they can use it. So I think there are parallels there, but I don't know enough about the problems in broadband to say that it's a precise analogy. Well, Jack Riggs, thank you very much for your book, High Tension, FDR Battle to Power America is a great new addition into our entry. Thank you for joining us here today as part of the Roosevelt Reading Festival. Thank you for having me. And we'll be back tomorrow. Uh, we have two new authors coming in tomorrow afternoon. I hope you will join us then. Um, and uh, have a great night. Thank you.